Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 35 beginning in verse 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It's the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adar. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel. Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. The days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last, and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Church, this is the very word of God. And Lord, I pray that you would lead us today. I thank you that you do. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. Lord, we honor you today. We exalt your holy name. Give us ears to hear 
Give us eyes to see, eager hearts to receive and obey your word. Thank you for the encouragement that it is, the life and the light. It brings us out of darkness. Thank you that you raise the dead. Thank you for the, for the Holy Spirit that's work in a, who, that is at work in us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is God is in the details. When we read this passage, it, there's a sadness to it because Rachel dies. Isaac dies as well. But everyone is going to come to an end of, of their breath at some point or another. And every person that is named here, all of these 12 sons and their mothers, they're all passed away. But for everyone has put their faith in God, they still live. And that's why God is called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not that he was the God of Abraham, the, was the God of Isaac, and was the God of Jacob, but that he, he is, because he's the God of the living and not of the dead. Praise the Lord for that. So even those that we have had to say goodbye to, they're in Christ. They're in his presence, even as we speak. Thank God. So in spite of of that difficulty, of that detail that's contained here. And I want us to see that the Lord is, is showing us another snapshot, a picture of what He's doing in the lives of individuals pointing forward to the work that He is doing through Jesus Christ. Everything that God has, uh, has recorded for us in the Scriptures in the Old Testament leading up to Christ was was all pointing towards him, anticipating his arrival. And, and, and you turn page after page after page after page, account one after another of, of different individuals and their families, and we see that God is showing us snapshots of his story of redemption. And church, everything that has gone on since the cross, if we're in Christ, it's all pointing to Him. It's all pointing to the cross. Everything in history, before the cross and after the cross, is pointing uh, either forward or back to the work of that death and resurrection. What He's accomplished there for us, and because of the cross, we look ahead. We look forward also. So we look in two ways, back at the cross and what He's done for us, and forward to His soon return. We're going to be celebrating around the table in just a few minutes where Paul tells us that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are showing the Lord's death. But not just showing the Lord's death. You're showing the Lord's death until He comes. We have an amazing confidence because of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. Well, here is uh, Jacob, Israel, and he is, he's on a journey back. He's coming back to Hebron. He's been away for 21 years. They, on their way back, they, they had come to Bethel. And from Bethel, they're making their way to place that we're familiar with, and particularly in this Christmas season, Bethlehem. See, 21 years earlier, Jacob had left home and he stopped at this place called Bethel. We read about it in chapter 28. Bethel means house of God. And, and there's some some names here of these places that we don't get when we read it in the English. We just see Bethel, right? 
and on its own, it, it just is a place. When, when we see Ephrath, it, it's just a place for us. When we see Rachel, it's, it's just a name in English. But this is a picture of, of the redemption of God through Jesus Christ, a foreshadowing and an throwing something to us, revealing something to us to anticipate what he would do in the arrival of his son, Jesus. The house of God. They're heading to Bethlehem. Something happens along the way just, just on the outskirts of Bethlehem at Ephrath at a place called Migdal Eder. We, we see it in the text here is in verse 21, the last part of it, he pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adar. The tower means, is, is in the Hebrew, Migdal. Migdal Adar is the name of the place. And if your translation says tower of the flock, they've translated that for us. But it would say Migdal Adar. See, coming from Bethel, what happened at Bethel? Jacob, he had a vision of God. There was a ladder or a staircase, if you will, that, that it was touching heaven and earth. And on that, there was ascending and descending angels. And it was at that place that the Lord told Jacob that I'm going to bless you. But even in that, this, this place that he named Bethel, the house of God was anticipating the one who would come, Jesus himself, who in John chapter 1, speaking to one who would become his disciple, Nathaniel. He said, you're going to see even greater things than you've seen already. You're going to see heaven opened and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of God, the Son of Man. What Jesus is saying there is, is he's pointing back to Genesis chapter 28 saying that I am the one in whom all the promises are fulfilled and I am the one who is the mediator. The staircase, if you will, the connection between God and man. Coming from Bethel, there's, there's still some distance from Ephrath. What does Ephrath mean? Ephrath or Ephrathah. It means fruitful. God is going to do something fruitful through this place, Ephrathah. We see it as Ephrath in the Hebrew. It's literally Ephrathah. And Rachel went into labor. Rachel means you. E-W-E -E, or lamb, a you lamb. A female lamb. that is going to take place in, in just about 1,800 years from this point in time, there's going to be a, another lamb that's going to be brought to bear in Bethlehem. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Fruitfulness. Through, through Jesus Christ, much fruit was going to be produced. You and I would experience the... the the bounty of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You look at the cross and you consider it for a moment. A cross was, was sometimes a, an old tree for an upright and then the cross piece that was, would be mounted there or it would, be, it would be lumber cut from a tree and it would be left as the upright planted in the ground as it were. It would be dug and, and put into the ground waiting for those executions we called crucifixion. And the, those, those victims that were crucified there, you look at that and, and the scripture refers to the cross as a tree, but you look at the tree across two pieces of lumber, dead wood, and it's not fruitful. You look at that and the only thing that it bears is death. There's no life on those limbs. There's no life on those pieces of wood. They, they've, they were chopped down some time ago. But when we look at Jesus Christ, when He hung on that tree, 
Many would see death and death claiming another victim. But Jesus was not a victim. Jesus was and is the victor. See, He gave Himself to death. He, he laid down His life. And Jesus says in John chapter 10, And because I have laid it down, my Father has given me authority to take it back up again. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down freely of my own accord. Aren't you glad today that Jesus didn't go kicking and screaming to the cross? But he said, here I am, ready to do your will, O Lord. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, much fruit has been produced. Jesus would state that just the week before, uh, the early part of the week before he went to the cross. He says, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But when it goes into the ground, it will produce a great harvest. He was speaking of himself that, that unless he died, we would remain in our sins. But because of his death and his resurrection, you and I have been delivered because he is the victor over sin, hell, and the grave. Ephrath, fruitful. She begins to experience, Rachel begins to experience hard labor. And when it was, when it was ex ex exceptionally difficult, the midwife said to her, do not fear. Does that sound familiar of something that we would see in the account of Jesus surrounding his birth? In Luke chapter 1, verse 30, the angel Gabriel would appear to Mary and said to her, don't be afraid. There, there's echoes of this being spoken in, in a similar account and at the same place. Here they are at now just outside of Bethlehem and Mary, she would be in Bethlehem eventually. Don't be afraid. You're going to conceive and bear a son. His name is Jesus and he will deliver his people from their sins. So don't be afraid, for you have another son, her second son. But the birth was a hard one, and she would die as a result of it. And as she was dying, she gave her son a name. The name she gave is, you see it here in verse 18, was Ben-Oni. Ben is the word for son. Oni is, it, it can mean a couple of different things. It means suffering. It can mean sorrow. So son of my suffering, son of my sorrow. But it can also mean son of my strength. And then we, we see that, that she dies, but having left this namesake, son of my suffering, son of my sorrow, son of my strength. Uh, what, a, what a tag to be taken along. You, you, when you are being called Ben-Oni, if that was to be his name throughout the rest of his days, you're going to be like, no, it, it doesn't mean sorrow. I don't want to be called sorrow. It means strength. Let's emphasize the strength part. But here we see yet again another name pointing toward Jesus. He would experience suffering and sorrow. Mary, even when she, she and Joseph took Jesus to the temple, the days of her purification were over. And Simeon meets them, and he'd been longing for, for the Lord's deliverance. He'd been longing to see the one, the Messiah, who would come to set his people free. And when they came in, the Lord had witnessed in his spirit and said, This is the one, because the Lord had promised to him, You will not die until you see the Lord's Christ. 
And so he begins to prophesy, and amongst that prophesy coming on the end, it speaks to, to Mary and says that, that you're going to experience suffering because of this young boy. This little life, he's going to grow up. He's going to bring salvation for many, but, but a sword is going to pierce your heart. You're going to experience suffering and sorrow. And that indeed is what she experienced at the cross, right? When she saw her son dying there. And there's, there's this tearing of her, of her life as she sees this one who was prophesied some 31 or 30, 34 years earlier, dying at 33. Trying to figure out how to do this thing called be a parent, be a mother to, the, to God. Isn't it amazing that God would humble himself to that point and entrust himself into the care of two bungling human beings? I don't know about you, but I remember when we uh, became parents. I looked all over the place and I couldn't find an instruction manual. <laughs> We made a lot of mistakes along the way. But the Word of God led us and taught us. We did a lot of right things, too. And, and had we had a second, it would have been, okay, we would have learned from the first and not to do this and to do that better and so on. But God taught Mary and Joseph suffering. But we see in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that sorrow, there was incredible strength. Because the strength of God was being displayed on that cross. If you are the Son of God, come down from there is what people said, yes? If you are. In our humanity, we look at that and say, well, if I'd have been God and I was the one on the cross, I'd have come down right away and showed them and showed them a thing or two. I would have... I would have maybe turned the tables around and come off the cross and put the one that just taunted me and put them on the cross. Said, that's what you deserve. I'm here in your place. But he didn't come as one to, to rub our noses in what he was doing. He came to offer indescribable grace. Grace that is amazing beyond really our comprehension. If we think that we, we have gotten a hold of the grace of God in its entirety, we are missing out. Notice it says still in our text, but his father called him Benjamin. Meaning son, Ben, son of my right hand. And yet again, Jesus being pictured for us in this name, Son of my right hand. Notice that it doesn't say, but Jacob called him. Or his new name is, is Israel. See, if you look back just, uh, just a few verses, we see that in verse 9, God appeared to Jacob again when he had come from Padanaram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob. But Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And, and we get that coming back, uh, just to back to chapter 32, just, just a, a short time prior to this, just, just yesterday. Excuse me, not just yesterday, just a short time earlier. He, in, verse, in chapter 32, he wrestles with God. So just a few days earlier, this is taking place. And God changes his name at that point. And when he wrestles with him, your name is Israel. And now in, in this passage, in chapter 35, God is, is reiterating it. He says, your name is Israel. Now you would expect, if, if God has made such an emphasis on his new name, Israel, just prior to this occurrence, to this event, that you would think that it might say that now Israel called his name Benjamin. But it doesn't. It says, but his father called him Benjamin. 
And I believe that the, the Word of God puts it like that to show that it's, it's the Father. The Heavenly Father calls His name Benjamin. The Father calls His name Son of my right hand. And we see that Jesus, after His, his resurrection and His ascension, we see in, in Mark chapter 16, He's ascended and now He's seated at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 1 speaks of the same thing. He's ascended, and we know that he's at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians chapter 1 speaks about it. Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 10 speaks about the fact that he's at the right hand of the Father. Son of my right hand. Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, to Bethlehem. See, he was on his way to where? He was on his way to Hebron. If we look at verse 27, he's on his way to Hebron. We'd seen that earlier. He's, he's coming to his father Isaac at Mamre, which means bitter, bitterness, or, or it can mean strength as well. There, strong bitterness that, that the one who would come for the salvation of our souls, he's going to experience Strong bitterness. He's coming to the place that's also known as Kiriath Arba, the city of four. Speaking of what it's like, the four corners of the earth, as it were. To Hebron, mean joining. Jesus, when he came to earth, there was a joining that took place of his divinity and humanity in one. Never before, never before had there been an existence of humanity in the nature or the character of God. Mythology, it's all about man trying to become as God, which isn't possible. Here we have God not just coming down to man, Emmanuel, God with us, but this is God becoming a man. Emmanuel, one of us coming down among us, God with us. He sets up a pillar where he buries Rachel. And, and it's at the location of the Tower of the Flock, Migdal Eder. What significance is Migdal Eder? We've already seen it, it means Tower of the Flock. Will you turn ahead with me to Micah? Chapter 4. Micah chapter 4. This is a good place for a sword drill. First one there, stand to your feet. Micah. <laughs> as long as you're not using a digital source, because <laughs> that, that would be considered cheating in this case. Micah chapter 4. In that day, as verse 6, declares the Lord, I'll assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away, and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off, a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, there it is, Migdal Eder, you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Kingship, it can only speak of one thing, it speaks of the king. Why do you cry aloud, is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished, that pain seized you like a woman in labor? So he's saying, the promise is for a king to come, where? To Migdal Eder, just on the outskirts of Bethlehem. This king is coming and they're saying, well, there's no king amongst us. We haven't had a king for some time now. And, and, and you, you promise there's going to be a king? Then down to chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, echoes there from Genesis chapter 35. What does Bethlehem mean? It means... House of bread. House of bread. 
And Jesus came as what? What did He call Himself? I am the bread of life. I am the bread of heaven. It was in Bethlehem, a place that really wasn't significant on, on the map so far as the world was concerned. I mean, if you were the, if you were the king of, of the universe and you were going to introduce yourself as a man to your people, you would think that you would go to at least the capital of the country you have designated for your people. You'd go to Jerusalem, but he didn't. He, he went to Bethlehem. Just in, in, a, in a nondescript location. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, the house of bread that is fruitful, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, in other words, you're insignificant. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel. This is the king that's spoken about a few verses earlier. Whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. It's speaking of this one who has no beginning. God in the flesh. Well, can we come ahead now to Luke chapter 2? We know that in chapter 2 of Luke, this is the Christmas story, the traditional, at least best part of the Christmas story that we would be familiar with. We know that Mary and Joseph needed to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem to be taxed. And, and while they were there in verse 6, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Do you remember we saw Migdal Eder? Tower of the flock. See the tower of the flock stood in the fields just outside of the town of Bethlehem and, and these towers were the, was for the purpose of two things. One is so that the, the shepherds could go up into the top part of that tower to overlook the fields and watch for threats wild animals that, that might pose a threat to come and snatch one of the, the sheep away. Maybe thieves or robbers. So you would have a few shepherds. One that would be going up and keeping a, a lookout on the tower. There would be others in the, flock, in, the, in the field with their flocks. And then in the bottom part of that tower was what they called the birthing place for the ewes. So they would bring the, the ewes in there that were ready to give birth and when these ewes were birthing, the shepherds were there with cloths to catch these ewes as they came out of the womb so that they didn't land on the ground and thereby possibly bruise themselves or, or maim, get maimed somehow. They would clean off the lambs and then they would wrap these lambs in swaddling cloths. So that this was a picture that they were very familiar with, intimately familiar with. So that when the, the angel appeared to them, these shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Here's, here it is again, fear not. Don't be afraid. Rachel, don't be afraid. You have a son. Don't be afraid you have a son. Don't be afraid because I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby, what? Wrapped in swaddling cloths. For them it will be swaddling cloths. See, this isn't just a matter of you're going to find a baby in, in a pair of sleepers. You're going to find a baby in, in cute pajamas. You're going to find a baby in, in a nice blanket wrapped up. That's not what this... We, we swaddle babies, right? This isn't what, what this picture was. This is swaddling cloth, strips of cloth that were meant for, for swaddling to keep the lamb from struggling, to keep it safe. 
When they hear swaddling cloths, they're thinking lamb, newborn lamb. See, these weren't just ordinary shepherds. These weren't just your, your grade B shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. These are shepherds that are keeping watch in the flocks over what fields? The fields of Bethlehem. That made these shepherds Levitical shepherds. That means that the sheep they were taking care of were sheep that were meant for sacrifice just a few miles to the north in Jerusalem. God is in the details. Everything that He does is specific and intentional, and He involves mankind in it. And He directs our steps. The psalmist said the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Amen to that. See, the world has tried to lay claim to that title of something being in the details or someone being in the details, but they never, they never say that God is in the details. They always, if that phrase is used, they will always designate it as someone else as being in the details. The devil is in the details. You ever heard of that? Meaning that it's just monotonous and you don't want to have to go through it. And if you look at the details, it's going to end up coming back to bite you. But church, it's not the devil that is in the details, it's God who is in the details. God is writing our story. It's a story of redemption. And he's not missed any detail. He hasn't forgotten to cross the T's or dot the I's or put in the commas or the exclamation marks or the question marks. Everything is there in, in, in correct prose and, and indentation and paragraphing and sentence and grammar and so on. This story is a story authored by God Himself. It's a story of redemption. And when we look at our life story, we say, well, boy, it sure seems like this story is, has gone off the rails and, and the author has forgotten about me and it's, it's taken on a life of its own now. And we can all look at our lives over, over since our birth at some point for durations longer and some shorter, some frequent and some less, we've seen our, our life stories go like that and we think, God is, is in the details? But God is the God of redemption. He redeems every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our story, every single aspect. And He has, he has demonstrated that very fact in giving to us not just Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. Here's what I did and I sent my son into the world without context. It begins in Genesis chapter 1. Takes us right back there. And then some of the writers of the New Testament, Peter and John the Apostle, says that, that Jesus, He is the Lamb slain from when? Not from the cross. Not from the time that he was hung by those nails on that wooden tree. But he's the lamb slain from when? We know our word. The scriptures, when is it? He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This was not an afterthought. This is not an event without context. And the best part about it is that God gave us the information regarding it. Let's put it on the right side and fit a little better. He gave us the details throughout the, the, the scriptures leading up to his arrival. Everything in, in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. Everything, every single detail is pointing to Jesus. And so the shepherds learn that this is going to be the sign that the one who, is, who has been born 
is wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. A Savior, Christ the Lord. And there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. How could they not say this? This is not just a Christmas greeting. Church, this is a, a, a magnification of the glory of God to man. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, God has done something. Tonight is what they're saying. Tonight, but it's been in the works for longer than you can even fathom. Peace among those with whom He is pleased. How, is, how do we find ourselves pleasing to God? It's the work that He does in us to respond to Him. To receive His Word. He speaks His Word. He's always at work, church, and He's given us His Word. And when we receive His Word by faith, He credits to us His righteousness. That's how we please God, is by receiving His Word. And the Word was made flesh at this point. And these shepherds are getting ready. They're receiving the Word that the Word has been made flesh and is now dwelling amongst us. They went away. The angels went away into heaven. The shepherds said, oh, I'm, I'm not staying here. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's, let's go into town. They're just on the outskirts at Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock. Let's go in. See this thing that has been known to us. They went with haste. In other words, they ran found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. See, see they're coming away from there. They're saying, the Savior has been born. And many in Bethlehem would have said, what are you talking about? And dismissed them. But we know that they, these were men that were, were short on time for their jobs. Because soon they're going to have to start looking for new work. Because the, there's not going to be any use for shepherds in Bethlehem for this purpose any longer. Because this baby is going to grow up and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the way John introduces him. John the baptizer. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus would grow up. The Lamb of God. The Son of His suffering. The Son of sorrow. The Son of strength. The Son who sits at the right hand of God, the one who was born the bread of life, the one who came from heaven, the bread that comes down from heaven and brought about fruitfulness for you and me. Life, what is fruitfulness? It speaks of life, does it not? Fruitfulness is life, brought life for you and me. He came from the house of God to bring you and me to the house of God. Jesus said the night before he went to the cross, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if it was not so, I would have told you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, you can be sure that I am going to come again to take you to be with me where I am. Where was Jesus going? He was going to Bethel, the house of God, his father's house. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to take you to Bethel, the house of God, as it were. I'm going to take you to my father's house. Every single detail. The scripture points out Jesus fulfilled it with specification. Intimately. Intricately. Leaving no detail. Untouched. Unfulfilled. And you might say, well, what about this detail? What about this prophecy? If a prophecy has not yet been fulfilled... 
those are the ones that he will fulfill at his second coming. And that's what we're looking forward to. As we celebrate Christmas, that we rejoice that, that he has every single detail of our lives in the palm of his hands. Every single detail. He looks to glorify himself in the details of our lives. He doesn't waste it. He doesn't waste any situation in our lives. He uses it. And when we think, God, have you lost my file? Have you forgotten about me? Why is this happening to me? We look at this, this account and, and Mary and Joseph, they become the guardians, if you will. We call them the, his parents, but not biologically. But they were, they were in, entrusted with raising and looking after this baby. And raising him to, to adulthood. But this radically changed their lives. And you look at it in one way, it became an incredible inconvenience for them, especially in the beginning. Because who's going to believe a young teenage woman that she's now pregnant by God? The Spirit of God has come upon her, and now she's pregnant that way. They're going to blame Joseph, and Joseph knows it wasn't him. He's going to blame somebody else, and we know the story, right? God appears to Joseph tells him what's taken place with Mary, so now he's ready to take her to be his wife, but waits until after the baby is born to have relations with her. Every detail, even when it seems like an inconvenience to us. When, when we have the heart like Mary to say, I don't understand how all of this has taken place. I don't understand how, how this is going to work. And, and I wish I had more information. I wish I knew the end from the beginning like you do, but I'm not God. So, Lord, I will trust you who know, who declares the end from the beginning. So I don't, I don't understand all of this, but like Mary, we can say, be it unto me according to your word, even as you have said. Be it unto me through the highs and the lows, the joys and the sorrows, the celebrations and the sufferings. We want to know the power of His resurrection. United with Him in the sufferings. Lord, we thank You that You're in the details. Every detail, every detail, so that every promise that you have made is, is yes and amen through Jesus Christ. Lord, as these shepherds would be preparing themselves to take these sheep to Jerusalem and wrapping them in swaddling cloths for the journey, those few miles, knowing from that point on that these, these sheep have, they have a limited amount of time to, to foreshadow to these people that the Savior has now arrived and will lay his life down for the salvation of all mankind. Thank you, Lord, that through the cross you've produced an abundant harvest. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to once again surrender to you and say, Lord, I know that you're the Lord of my life. We've said it before. We, we, we state it again. Whatever you choose to do in writing our stories, whether it's in our suffering and pain or our, our, our joys and celebrations, may it be that through them you will glorify your name. 
whether it be in our living or our dying. Lord, may it be that you would glorify your name. We would do all to the glory of God. Trusting you in the process, trusting you in the details. So that when, when we tell people about our story, we're telling people about you. We're telling people about what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Can I invite you to stand with me as we celebrate and worship around the table? Paul tells us that on the, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. You know, we, we hold in our hands the, the bread and the, and the cup. Both of them are the result of the blessing of God because He is the one who caused the ground to produce and grain was the result. And the grain was taken and milled and put into flour and able to make this bread. And did the same thing to, to give us the fruit of the vine and the, the fruit of the vine was then crushed and the, the juice expressed so that now we have the fruit of the vine, the cup. It speaks of the, the fruitfulness of the life and the work of Jesus Christ, and not just 2,000 years ago, but the fruitfulness of his life in our lives right here today. So, so he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said... This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we eat of this today, let's, let's eat in remembrance of the fact that, that nothing in our lives is in vain when we are in Christ. Nothing is empty without purpose when we're in Christ. So, Lord, we bless you and praise you for that, for the new life that is ours in you. We worship you. Let's eat together. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is one of the highest acts of worship that we can participate in, is when we gather around and worship together with the, the bread and the cup. 
that represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The new covenant that has been secured for us because of his sacrifice on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the fruit you're producing in our lives, the life that is ours, the fullness, the purpose. Thank you, Jesus. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are showing the Lord's death until he comes. What a privilege. What a responsibility. Thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to write us in to your story, to make us sons, children of the Most High, heirs of yours, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Thank you for the presence, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in these these humble temples. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. So. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings your praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings your praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Lord, I know that our stories aren't being written down in the Bible for people to see and read, but our lives are a testimony of your goodness. And even for some, for a generation yet to be born, should it be that long before you return? Lord, take your faithfulness in our lives. And may it be on display. May we take care to, to sing your praise, to speak of your goodness, to glorify you and to not be afraid. In Jesus' name, amen.